Uh, thanks for joining us at today's OSC colloquium. So today I have the great privilege of uh, welcoming Professor Luyan Zhao from the uh, University of Michigan to give today's colloquium. So Luyan got her uh, bachelor's from the University of Science and Technology of China, um, her PhD at Columbia University, uh, and was a, did her postdoctoral training at Caltech. Um, so Luyan is really an expert in using optical techniques to really probe uh, new materials. Um, so in particular, I would say she's become a world expert in sort of two distinct areas. Um, so one is sort of uh, using optics to probe uh, two-dimensional magnets and also more heterostructures uh, formed from these 2D magnets, in particular using uh, Raman scattering techniques. Uh, and also um, using nonlinear optics um, to probe new types of orders and interesting quantum materials, in particular multipolar orders, uh, which she'll tell us about today. Uh, so for her pioneering work, um, she's been rec recognized by you know, several professional awards, in including a NSF Career Award, um, Air Force Young Investigator Award, Sloan Fe Fellowship, uh, and many, many more. So <laughs> uh, very much looking forward to your talk today. And let's give Leanne a very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Kyle, and um, thank you for both the invitation and this very, very kind introduction. So it's been a wonderful day here at the University of Arizona. I see people from physics and people from College of uh, Optics, so both are great and fantastic. So um, in today's talk, I'm going to sort of uh, show our recent effort in using nonlinear optics to probe this state of matter called multipolar order. So I'm a condensed matter experimentalist. So for me, I care a lot about materials physical properties while I'm using optics as a probe to see what's happening in the material. So then when we look into materials or when we choose materials to look at, we typically care about one thing, whether or not there are interesting interactions in the material. Because as our knowledge accumulate over the years, we know that interesting interactions can bring up interesting collective behaviors. Okay, so if you allow me to sort of coarsely divide interactions into two big families. So one is that people want to leverage the complexity of interactions, meaning that people want to see the strong interactions of multiple degrees of freedoms of millions and billions of particles inside the solid materials. Another category is that people try to hopefully make the interactions simpler but uh, the result may be not as wished to be simpler, but the direction is really to reduce the interaction to be within the two-dimensional limit, okay, and reduce the third dimension of the macroscopic material. So in the first family, the complexity of the interactions, we typically care about four different degrees of freedom. Of course, there are other degrees of freedom when people know more and more materials. Let me just focus on this four here. So crystals are made of atoms arranged in periodical structure most of, most of the time. So then crystal lattice will give us one degree of freedom. And then we have electrons that are in the outer shells of those atoms. So then electrons have three degrees of freedom. One is charge, one is orbital, and one is spin. So then most of the cases, it's the interaction of these four different degrees of freedom in a solid state material that makes the material more and more interesting. So let me sort of highlight two types of interactions among these four different degrees of freedom. So one is the so-called electronic correlation. This one is essentially the Coulomb repulsion between the charge that gives the electronic correlation. But Coulomb repulsion is everywhere for all the materials as long as you have electrons. So what's so specific about uh, correlated materials, it has a criteria. It requires your Coulomb repulsion to be stronger than your kinetic energy of the electron. So then when your electron move around, then they feel the whole sea of other strongly interacting electrons. That makes the picture harder to be um, sort of like simplify to be independent electrons anymore. So that is a so-called strongly correlated physics regime. And here, we sort of can uh, realize phenomena like um, unconventional superconductivity, uh, magnetism, and other things, okay? Um, another interaction that people got so interested over the past few decades was the spin-orbit coupling. So this is a relativistic effect at the atomic scale, if you wish. So it is the electron that orbits around this positive core. 
So then when this electron orbits around, it sort of generates an effective uh, current. And the looping current is giving an effective magnetic field. And then this effective magnetic field acts on the spin of this electron to give an energy correction. So then when this energy correction got bigger and bigger, you can actually flip the orbital orders. So usually we would anticipate P orbital is higher energy than S orbital. But because of this correction, sometimes in certain atomic system, you can get uh, S orbital has higher energy than P orbital. So this kind of concept can also be brought into materials. In the materials picture where you have a whole um, arrangement of atoms, the language turns into that. The wave function of the electrons of those materials can have topology because of the spin orbit coupling. Okay. So then these two types of interactions sort of led to major threads of condensed matter research over the past uh, few decades. So concurrent with this topological physics, people also made effort to do this reduction. So the beginning of the so field is really like people managed to isolate a monolayer of graphite out of its bulk counterpart. Once people managed to do so, then there are a lot of good things to anticipate by the virtue of the absence of this third dimension. So graphene tells us that once you remove its neighbors and get it down to the monolayer, the electronic band structure will be very, very different. So this is sort of also realized in transition metal dichotinite, where Kyle is an expert on. Yeah. And then for transition, di that transition metal dichotinite, there's another benefit because it's a semiconductor. So then you also lose screening from electrons from the top and from the bottom. So then when you talk about exciton, which is pairs of electron hole, their interaction became very, very strong due to the absence of screening from top and bottom. So again, Kyle is an expert in this direction. So in addition to that, when people talk about uh, phase transitions, so then one can sort of like realize that uh, when you have this two-dimensional real space, in the momentum space, we also have two dimensions. So then the two-dimensional momentum space actually corresponds to a very much reduced phase space. That will make the electronics and also the magnetism are subject to high instabilities. Okay. In addition to that, because of the two dimension, it can also populate thermal or quantum fluctuations. Whether or not these kind of things are good or bad, it's case by case. But these are the new flavors that 2D can bring us to. Okay. So then, um, my group sort of look at one particular consequence of interactions, because interaction can bring too many different consequences. And we look at one particular one. So that is the spontaneous symmetry breaking orders, meaning that because of the interaction, the electrons or the spins inside the material will spontaneously organize together to form particular patterns. And that pattern will have different symmetry as you compare it to the underlying crystal lattice. Because of the symmetry difference, we call it spontaneous symmetry breaking phases. Okay. So there are many examples. If we look into the literature, the, one of the most well-known examples is the so-called charge density wave. This is because of the electron phonon interaction. So then the charge actually forms this kind of clusters. So these clusters breaks the translational symmetry of the underlying crystal lattice, make the period of electron longer than the period of the lattice. Okay, and then another example is the so-called pneumatic order. For this particular case, it's that if your material has four photo rotational symmetry, meaning that rotating every 90 degree since recover. Due to the emergence of pneumaticity, you will only have two photo rotational symmetry. So it is breaking from four fold to two fold. And the charge order in high temperature copper oxides will break both translational symmetry and also rotational symmetry. So it's a combination of the two. And then ferromagnetism we are fairly familiar with. So then it breaks time reversal symmetry. When you do a time reversal operation, the spin up turns into spin down. Okay. And then ferroelectricity, it breaks spatial inversion symmetry. You have polarity here. If you do spatial inversion, then the polarity up will turn into polarity down. Okay, so these are the sort of like familiar examples in the literature nowadays we know what kind of broken symmetries we chase after so that we can identify the presence of this kind of phases. Okay, 
So in my group at Michigan, we sort of like look at materials in both categories, as Kyle was saying. So in the first category, we really hope that we push our detection technique more and more sensitive, so then we can see subtler and subtler symmetry breaking phases. So that are typically done in the three-dimensional materials. So then for the sort of lower dimensional case, we more focus on whether we can control the physical properties of the material more. For example, as Kyle said, we can do this twist of magnets to see whether new magnetic states can come up. There, we typically use more conventional experimental techniques because the system itself is already possible enough. Okay. So then, in this particular talk, it belongs to the first family. So we look into three-dimensional materials, and those materials are known to have certain kind of state, which called multipolar orders. So by the introduction of multipolar orders, I hope that I can convince you this kind of order is actually widely present in many families of materials. However, they are often hidden to many experimental techniques due to their intrinsic natures. Okay? And after that, I will talk about our experimental technique, which is second Hamon generation. So this technique has been there for many, many, many years. And it is known to detect breaking of inversion symmetry. So then, in this particular part, I hope to sort of highlight two more things about SHG. So one is that if we push the sensitivity, we can detect phase transitions that still have inversion symmetry. So this is sort of challenge the conventional wisdom of detecting inversion symmetry breaking states by SHG. And the second part I want to highlight is that for nonlinear optics, we typically have multiple copies of electromagnetic fields. It is the composition of them to construct a special fashion that can help you to direct couple into the multipolar. If you use lower rank processes, they cannot get there, okay? So then, with those preparation, I hope to show two particular examples. So those two examples all have spatial inversion, so I call them central symmetric examples. One is the so-called ferro rotation order. It is this kind of head-to-tail loop arrangement of electric dipole moment within the unit cell, and then repeat itself across long distance. Okay. And the second example is a so-called all-in, all-out anti-ferro mechanism for a Kagomi metal. So the all-in, all-out anti-ferro magnetism itself is also essentially a relatively complex spin texture. Okay. So, and uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to stop me. So I'd be happy to discuss. Yeah. So let's start by the first part, the introduction about multipolar order. So this kind of multiple moment was sort of introduced in classical ENM when we trying to describe the arrangement of uh, charge or arrangement of magnet dipole. So for example, if it is just a simple charge, which we only have for electric counterpart. So if it's a sing single charge, then it's a monopole. This monopole, we only have to have one number to represent it's big or small. So it's just a scalar quantity when we describe it. So then dipole for the electric part is two opposite charge aligned together. So for dipole, either electric or magnetic, we, only, we will need a vector to describe it because you need its magnitude and its orientation. So then it's a three by one quantity if we were to describe it. But then if you look at quadrupole, then we will sort of need another higher rank. We will need a three by three tensor to describe a quadrupole. So on and so forth, when we do to go to octopole, we will need a three by three by three tensor to describe it. So then as we can see that, the more complex of the arrangement, the higher rank tensor you will need to describe this object. Yeah. Okay. So then what's bad about this, right? So when we look about uh, this imaginary cartoon here, imagine we have a square lattice like every square here. Within the square lattice, let me insert a electric quadruple into it. So once we do this in such a ferro equal way, you can see that this pattern actually does not break any translational symmetry because it repeats itself exactly in every square. So then the squares period is the period of this electric quadruple. So then when people are trying to use diffraction techniques to measure this thing, they actually are going to face a lot of challenges because you don't have new peaks to show up due to the absence of translation. There's no translational symmetry breaking. 
Yeah. But uh, if you take a more careful look at this object, so the square lattice will have fourfold rotational symmetry, meaning that I rotate 90 degrees since recover. But this electric quadrupole would only have twofold. If you rotate 90 degrees, you switch the positive and negative, they do not come back to itself. So then you have to rotate 180 to return to itself. This means that the point symmetries are typically breaking by this kind of orders. And the third thing is that, as we said, to describe such a thing, we need a tensor. So then when we look into the fields that are available to us, electric field, magnetic field, strain field, so on and so forth, electric field and magnetic field are only vector fields. So then if you use electrical methods or magnetic methods to capture this tensor, you cannot capture it efficiently in the linear response. So that's why it's very hard to see often, just because we don't have the right field to see it. Okay. Okay. So then we said that square lattice with the electric quadruple on it is just a cartoon. So then we look into the literature to see, are this cartoon just an imagination or is this cartoon actually represents facts in materials? So here I'm just showing some examples. So the, 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 the conclusion is that the multipolar orders are actually widely present in many, many materials. And we start by this example called F electron system. So F electron system is a spatial system that realizes unconventional superconductivity and unique magnetism. But however, when people do thermodynamic, thermodynamic measurements of F electron systems, they always see some thermodynamic signature that is an anomaly in the temperature dependence. But they never know what is the nature of this anomaly. They try all kinds of techniques to measure it. They don't get a conclusion what's there. So because of this uncertainty about what's the nature there, they call it the hidden order. So then after a few tens of years, people now converge to the point that this so-called hidden order in F electron system perhaps is most likely multipolar moments there. It's just our conventional technique is so hard to set. But thermodynamically, because of the ordering, yeah, your thermodynamics still works. You can still see the anomaly there. Okay. So another system is this so-called 5D transition metal oxides. This is also an emergent system where the spin orbit coupling and the electronic correlation are coexisting in the system. So previously we said these two interactions are the main threads in condensed matter research over the past few decades. And this 5D transition metal oxides is a intersection of those two interactions. They are both there and they are both strong. Okay, so because of this kind of competition or cooperation of these two interactions, multipolar order are anticipated in this regime theoretically. And in fact, experimentally, it has been demonstrated in some iridium oxide system, you have octuple orders in terms of magnetic phases, okay? So we also have a more recent magnetic system, people call it chiral magnets. You can see that it happens on this Kagomi lattice with non-collinear spin textures. So if you add all the spins together, it's zero mechanization. But what's interesting is that when you do anomalous Hall effect measurement, you actually see a Hall signal without applying external magnetic field. This is kind of counterintuitive. And also when you measure magnetic circular dichroism or MOC or magneto optical curve effect, you will see a fairly large value out of this particular state without mechanization. And then the reasoning behind that for this kind of off-diagonal terms showing either in optical response or in transport response is because such a system hosts a octopole order, which is of the same symmetry as ferromagnetic order, of the same symmetry. Okay. So then, so on and so forth, we will also have multi-ferroics where you can design this kind of complex spin textures or electrodipole textures, and their description also requires multipolar moment. And beyond that, we can still list many other examples. So with this sort of like brief literature review, I hope to say that uh, such a thing is not imaginary. It's there in real materials, right? So not only us know they're in real materials, many people know they're in real materials. So the effort is really to, how can we do to see them? So then I'm going to give a very brief overview of development of probes for measuring the so-called multipolar orders. So the very first kind of probe is really indirect. 
Those are the ones I mentioned for the F electron studies in the early days. It's the thermodynamic measurements, where because of the um, ordering phenomenon, the thermodynamics shows anomaly in their temperature dependence. So then they measure the presence of something being there, but because of this measurement do not tell the nature of the order. So then they don't know what is that, even though they know something is there. So this is a so-called indirect probe. They include specific heat, magnetic susceptibility sometimes, also um, resistivity measurements. You see anomalies. Mm -hmm. So sooner after that, people dive into the first type of direct probes. This is really because like, for a long time, people always believed diffraction techniques and NMR are super sensitive to symmetry breakings because they have local sensitivities of scenes arranged. So then they adapt this kind of technique to study multipolar orders. So in principle, they should have this kind of ability because they really know the local arrangement of either electrodipo or magnetic dipo. But the challenge there was because for diffraction techniques, you are relying on the form factor to see the presence of the thing. To extract the form factor, you will need to fit many, many peaks and care about their relative size. So sometimes the relative size only change a teeny tiny bit. So then for them to give a conclusive remark on what's going on there is a little bit challenging, even though in principle they totally work. Okay, and this technique sort of include uh, resonant X-ray, non-resonant X-ray, neutron, and LMR. This is really leverage their local sensitivity to do the measurement. So more recently, there's a second type of direct probe. In the second type of direct probe, people no longer say, I'm going to see the local arrangement, rather to say, I want to ask, what is the global consequence of having such an order? So then they try to make some kind of uh, fields that can directly couple into the multipolar order. The multipolar order is tensor. So then when they construct the field to couple into it, they purposely construct tensor fields. So then tensor fields are typically constructed if you can do nonlinear measurements or you start with tensor field and measure its response. Okay, so example of this is that they can do nonlinear magnetization measurement, meaning that they measure the magnetization as functions of products of multiple magnetic fields, rather than what we typically do, it's M equal to chi H. They do M equals to chi H, 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 <laughs> yeah. So they can also do elastoresistivity or magnetoresistivity. In here, they are measuring the resistance of the system while they control the strain of the material. So then strain is a tensor. Resistance, if you write it along the three different directions, that could be a vector. So then the coefficient that is bridging a tensor and a uh, vector is of higher rank, at least higher rank than most of our linear responses. So then the information is buried in these high rank tensors for them to see multipolar information. So then, we are sort of uh, inspired by this second type of probes because nonlinear response is one way for them to construct this kind of tensor field to couple into this tensor order parameter. So then we thought nonlinear optics is so standard nowadays since we have post laser where we can have really strong electromagnetic field. So then since we have really strong electromagnetic field, we can push the response into the nonlinear regime. Okay, so that was a bare motivation. So let me sort of like uh, very briefly using this electric dipole transition channel to illustrate linear optics, nonlinear optics. So this is induced electric dipole. In the plane wave approximation, the radiated field is proportional to this induced electric dipole. So I'm shining an electric field at the frequency of omega. So if the induced dipole is only proportional to one copy of this electric field, then I will have a three by three tensor here and my frequency will be omega in and then omega coming out, okay? But if the field is strong enough, then the induced polarization could be proportional to the square of the incoming electric field. So then we will have omega plus omega equals to two omega here. That will be the second order. As this goes up from first order to second order, you can see the rank of the response tensor chi became a higher rank tensor so on and so forth. If you go to higher order processes, you will just deal with higher rank tensors. So then what's good about this tensor? 
So the first thing is that this tensor is really bridging what you put into the material and what's coming into the material. So then this tensor should have the material's property, right? Because incoming thing is itself. Outgoing thing is the incoming field interacted with the material. And the interaction is described in this tensor. So then there is this famous Newman's principle. It says that if your material has this particular symmetry, then whatever tensor describe your material will obey exactly the same symmetry. Okay, so then in the other word, we can look at this kind of tensor's form to back out what are the symmetries the material have so that it ends up into such a form. So then in the other word, we are going to use this response tensor to resolve symmetries. So then linear response versus nonlinear response, we are having higher rank tensors for nonlinear response, meaning that we have more tensor elements available for us to discerning different symmetries. So one example would be, if you look at the linear response for hexagonal and for trigonal and also for uh, tetragonal crystal classes, everything looks the same in terms of form. But then themselves will be very different if you use second order processes or third order processes, just because I have more element there to tell the difference between them. Okay, so that's one benefit. Another benefit is sort of like we mentioned briefly before that. So if you look at the second order process, what I have is that two copies of incoming field and one copy of the outgoing field. So then each copy is a vector. So then we actually have three vectors. So in the real experiment, it is the three vectors coupled together to form a tensor. And then it's this tensor that will have the right symmetry to your multipolar order. Then make your multipolar order seeable through this process. So that's the second benefit. And the third benefit is sort of like a byproduct. Since we are using pulse laser, we can necessarily do just dynamics of it because we have time resolution. Okay. So the technique. So SHG, I think like many of you are so familiar about SHG. So um, if you look at the leading order electrodipole response, it is P equals to chi E E. So then if you assume your material has inversion symmetry, then it's equivalent of you do inversion operation on both sides. After this operation, you compare with your original equation. It sort of like force you to have P equals to zero if inversion is present in the system. So that's why people always say, okay, SHG is super sensitive to inversion symmetry breaking because its leading order electrodipole contribution vanishes in the system with inversion symmetry, okay? But uh, when we have better and better detectors, we can measure smaller and smaller SHGs. So then people start to figure out that in materials that normally have inversion symmetry, you can still see SHG. So then people were puzzled by that, perhaps for a little bit of time. But then they later on realized that you have different radiation sources. Even though the leading order electrodipole is gone by the inversion symmetry, you can still have the next order electroquadrupole or magnetic dipole, or even octopoles, if you wish. So then, this is sort of give us a subtle correction of the conventional wisdom. So it's essentially that SHG is there for all the materials. It's just whenever you have inversion symmetry breaking, you have big signal. Whenever you have no, uh, whenever you don't have inversion symmetry, you have big signal through the electric dipole uh, process. But whenever you have inversion, you have weaker signal, but from the high order processes, yeah. So we are going to sort of utilize this channel to study the phases that actually have inversion later on, yeah. So this technique was developed by um, a postdoc called Darius Torchensky, who is at Temple right now. So I learned this technique at Caltech when I was a postdoc there. This technique was really like uh, you rotate the light scattering plane to, to do the measurement. Let me go through it a little bit. So we call this technique the rotation anisotropy. In this experiment, we will have a light of frequency omega come in, and then reflect off the sample is a light of frequency two omega, okay? So then this incoming and outgoing form this scattering plane. So then for the polarization options, we can choose either polarization within this plane or polarization orthogonal to this plane for both incoming and outgoing beam. So then we have four channels that are complementary to each other, then instead of rotating sample that many people have tried before, here, they rotate the scattering plane. 
um, along the outer plane direction by an angle phi between the plane and the crystal axis, A, for example, here. So then they record the intensity as a function of this rotation angle phi in a selected uh, polarization channel. Okay, so that's their measurement. So then you can see that in this measurement process, the measurement itself is actually wholly symmetric. So then if you see a lower rotational symmetry, that lower rotational symmetry is coming from your sample. And also, because we are doing this whole symmetric measurement, whenever there's mirror planes, you can also see it from the data directly. Yeah. So that's the advantage of this. So then after you can see you go through all the seeable symmetries through this process, then you do a more careful analysis to figure out the susceptibility tensor. And also in our measurement care about symmetry breaking phases, we also make a connection between the tensor and the order parameter. Okay. Okay. This is how the measurement was done. Yeah, our data are typically plot in these polar plots, as Kyle might have shown. So the radial distance shows the intensity, and the azimuthal angle shows this rotation angle. So for Galen-Arschneid, it is a inversion symmetry breaking material, so SHG is strong, and then it has four photorotational symmetry and the mirrors. Then you can see that directly from the data. Okay. So and. SH has been there for a long, long time. It has been a tool mainly used to study symmetries of the crystals, crystal structure itself. Using SHG to study the electronic states and the magnetic states are relatively new as compared of using them to study the lattice. That's just because electronic state and magnetic state typically give weaker signal as compared to the crystal lattice itself. Okay, and then uh, for the magnetic material study, there is uh, Professor Manfred Fibic at EDH, so he is the leader of this direction. But then when we joined Dave's group, Dave sort of had this idea of saying that, why not we look at materials with a little bit more strange orders, rather than the more conventional magnets or the conventional ferroelectricity. Let's look into the material that we often call it more quantum. So then that's where we started this project. So at Caltech, so we are looking into compound of strontium iridate and cuprates. Iridate was thought to be an analog of cuprate, since it shows a lot of similar behaviors as cuprate. But then in cuprate, there's always a debate of what is the nature of the pseudo gap. So one theoretically proposed picture is that the pseudo gap perhaps hosts some kind of symmetry breaking phases, with a popular proposal to say inversion symmetry is breaking there. So then my postdoc work was sort of like say, can we make the technique a little bit more sensitive so that we are still using this conventional wisdom to look for inversion symmetry breaking phases, but just the inversion symmetry breaking is relatively subtle as compared to other cases. So Kyle also revised many of this results, I believe. So, so because it's a new field, so then the interpretation of the data took us some time to get to the right interpretation. Yeah. So then, after I started at Michigan, I sort of like uh, thought, okay, since now we have the sensitivity up to this level, we can already see central symmetrical materials, SHG. Why don't we just see phase transitions that actually obey spatial inversion symmetry? So then the first kind of uh, example that we choose is this so-called fair rotational order. So this is sort of start to challenge the conventional wisdom because we are trying to look for a phase transition actually has inversion symmetry. And we choose the electrodipolar nature to start with just because we believe electrodipolar's effect is going to be bigger, at least as compared to the magnetic dipolar's effect. So that is the beginning. And then more recently, we move a bit forward to say, what about we measure the magnetic dipolar's arrangement, which is supposed to have weaker signal. So then I'm going to show the result in these two cases. And I hope you will agree that the second case has way subtler signature than the first case. But nonetheless, we now can see both cases. OK? OK, let's start by here. The fair rotational order, people describe it to say it has a fair rotational moment. Mathematically, they just say you do a cross product of the dipolar moment with respect to its location. So it's R cross P, and then sum up all the six of them. So then it's a pseudo vector. But then whenever you have a pseudo vector, we typically ask us, what is its behavior under the spatial inversion and time reversal operation? 
right? Because we have vector fields as electric field versus magnetic field. One breaks spatial inversion, the other breaks time reversal. So then now we have a pseudo vector order we want to ask whether existing electric or magnetic field has the right symmetry to control or set. So then we take a look. Under spatial inversion operation and time reversal operation, this thing keep invariant, meaning that this thing does not break either spatial inversion or time reversal. So then our electric field or magnetic field cannot see it because they have different symmetry, okay? And this is sort of in contrast to our magnetic dipole moment that breaks time reversal and the electric dipole moment that breaks spatial inversion. So then this one you can see with electric field and magnetic one you can see with magnetic field. Yeah, this fourth quadrant is a magnetic counterpart of the rotational order, which people call it toroidal moment. So then for the toroidal moment, it breaks both spatial inversion and time reversal, which is actually not so bad because for now, you can actually use a combination of electric field and magnetic field to construct a thing that breaks both. So the reality is that when they control this order, they use two orthogonally aligned electric field and magnetic field then they have the right symmetry to couple into this order, okay? But this leaves the so-called fair rotational order as a leftover in this particular table. So people sort of know theoretically, many materials will have this same present, but because it does not couple to electric field or magnetic field, for a long, long time, it's just a theoretical picture of the thing. And people didn't know what to look for to prove its presence, okay? Okay, so then our first candidate is this so-called rubidium ion molybdenum oxide. So it has this kind of uh, layered crystal structure, and this layer is not Van der Waals layer, it's uh, ionically bonded layers. Okay, if you look into the material, there is a structural phase transition above 200 Kelvin, it has this symmetry. We call it bar 3M, which includes a three photorotational symmetry, three mirror planes that have 120 degree rotated from each other, and also a spatial inversion symmetry. So those are the generators of this symmetry point group. So then, when you cool down to low temperature, it's possible that all these green cages rotate clockwise, or all of them rotate counterclockwise. You can see that since it's a uniform rotation across a large length scale, it does not break any translational symmetry. Whatever period that you have above the transition remains to be the period below the transition. So then when people use diffraction technique to measure, they actually propose three quite different point groups. They cannot tell the difference between them, okay? So, and the tie to fair rotational order is here. So once this thing rotates, then the oxygen vertex is no longer in the center of the two positive ions. So then you will have a tangential electric dipole moment to emerge. And then you can see this tangential dipole moment loops around in the same direction as a cage rotation direction. And then in the opposite way, it's just a counterclockwise rotation. Yeah, loop, okay. So then we do our experiment. We do this so-called rotation anisotropy SH measurement. In this particular case that we look at the room temperature first because we know precisely what is the symmetry for the room temperature. So then these are the four channels as we mentioned before. For the four channels, you can immediately see that there is three photorotational symmetry and three mirror planes that are marked by the dashed lines, okay? And then for this particular case, we want to highlight that here 1.0 represents 1.5 femtowatt which is a pretty low signal level if we use more traditional detection scheme. So, so our group is trying to sort of push the detection sensitivity and the, mo like the most recent push is that we do this gated photon counting technique. So when we do that, we can count like 0 0.01 photons per second. Okay, so that helps us to see very small signals. So then to understand this, we know that the room temperature case has this so-called bar 3M point group. So then we can use this symmetry to confine our um, tensor form. So we said the tensor form reflects all the symmetry of the material. Once we know the symmetry, then we can come down to what's the form of the tensor. And we know that bar 3M has spatial inversion symmetry. So the leading order electric dipole is not there. That's why the signal is very weak. But then the next order electroquadruple could be there. So we simulate 
the tensor form for electroquadrupole SHG, and then we simulate this rotating process to have functional form for each channels, and then using the functional form that's written here to fit our data. You can see the fits is pretty reasonable here, yeah? But when you look more carefully, you can see that this functional form actually contains five coefficients for four channels, and this five coefficients is, again, linear superposition of turn elements. So that's not ideal if we really want to know the order parameter, because when we want to know the order parameter, we need to pin down to individual tensor elements, which we couldn't do in the current geometry. But we can do one thing that actually makes life simpler. Instead of doing this oblique, which is necessary to help us to narrow down its electric quadruple channel process, we can also do this measurement after we know the source. We do the measurement in normal incidence. So in the normal incidence, we eliminate the electric field's Z component or the component that goes into the material. So then we eliminate a lot of tensor elements in this process. And the fact is that it only has one tensor element being picked up. So then with this being simplified, we can do our temperature-dependent measurement. So then we watch the flower pattern change as a function of temperature. So we just cool down the material in the cross stat and take the very same measurement. So you will see sort of two features. The very first feature is that I have this valley goes to nearly zero at higher temperature. Right below this transition temperature, the valley no longer goes into zero anymore. So that is a pop-up of a background, is one signature. The second thing is that you can see the flower pattern was initially aligned its valley to the dashed line, but gradually you can see the valley is rotates away from the dashed line, right? And rotate more and more. The dashed line was the original mirror direction. Now your flower pattern rotates away from the dashed line, meaning that dashed line is no longer the mirror direction of your material but your mirror has to be along some kind of a crystal axis direction or a spatial direction relative to crystal axis. It cannot be in any random direction. So this observation is really telling us that the mirror symmetry that was present at high temperature disappeared at low temperature. Okay. Okay, so that is here. So then the question would be, which would be the point group that the three options that are provided by the diffraction techniques, right? So our flower pattern can rotate is actually a very important information. It is that if you look at the first proposed picture, that is 3M, it is to say that in this plane, I still have spatial directions that are this mirror. Whenever I have spatial directions, my pattern cannot be of a random relationship of this spatial direction. It has to be locked. That's why in the simulated case, you can see your valley locks to the mirror direction. And the second option is three, two. Two is the implant two photo rotational axis, and you have three of them. So then this also says that you have some spatial direction in the plane. So then a data cannot be of random relationship to spatial directions. That's why the similar data, you can see the peak locks to the dashed line. Okay. And the only option that allows the flower pattern to rotate around is actually this so-called bar three point group, which is a subgroup of bar three M by simply removing all the mirrors, okay? And by removing all the mirrors, this bar three has no spatial direction within the plane. So that's why your flower pattern is now freely rotating, right, okay? So then we still have one more puzzle. What is this background? So then we look into this phase transition. We said it can do clockwise or counterclockwise. So then in a really big material, it's supposed to be part of it do clockwise, the other part do counterclockwise. You have this kind of so-called domains. So when we first started this experiment, because the signal level is so low, we purposely made our beam really big. So then when the biggest beam is really big, when we cool down to low temperature, within the beam we had both options. So then it's a linear superposition of these two cases that gave us this background. You can imagine one thing rotates this way, and the other thing rotating the opposite way, so then their valley will miss each other. If their valley miss each other, then there's no valley anymore because valley will add to something finite, right? Yeah, so that's why we will have this kind of data here. So we have done further analysis of all the parameters, but for the sake of time, I will just uh, skip that part and say, okay, now, 
we know that we can measure this particular object. But unfortunately, our detection level was so low. So then we were not able to see individual domains. So then we hoped that what about if we shrink the beam down and then we push our detection a little bit. So because imagine if I have a beam diameter of 10, then shrink down to one, my area shrink by 100 times. So then my signal will shrink down by 100 times. And the signal was originally very small. It shrink down by 100 times. That's hot. But we still managed to do so by just give multiple amplifications. And then, yeah, this is just to illustrate the idea, a teeny tiny beam and then raster around the sample and then eventually construct this map. So then we measured for this fair rotational compound. And indeed, we can now see these domain structures. So these two cases are just for you highlight one domain versus the other. So they are complementary to each other. So that's another progress recently that we made. Then we can see individual domains. So then after we see individual domains, we were thinking now we can locate our beam into a single domain and measure its dynamics. To measure its dynamics, what we do is that we will still do the very same probe procedure. But on top of that, we introduce a pump beam. And then we let the pump beam to excite the material and then do the same measurement of the probe at different time delays between the pump and the probe. Okay. So you can see that is scanning our probe relative to the pump. So you can see when this order forms, you can clearly see this kind of oscillatory behaviors, right? So the oscillatory behaviors is fairly often seen in time-resolved optics, especially in time-resolved reflectivity when, we, when people see phonons, right? But there's one difference here. Usually when, when you do time-resolved reflectivity, you sort of do not care this angle you are looking at or the other angle you are looking at because most of the time it's isotropic response. But here you can see that my flower pattern is actually unisotropic. I have six lobes. So when my intensity changes, it can have two ways to bring this change. One is my flower pattern really become big and small, right? The other is my flower pattern that is rotate this way. So then if I only park at one direction to look at the data's time evolution, it's a convolution of the two contributions, which is the result, yeah. So then to sort of disentangle these two contributions, we just have to do a hard work. That is to measure flower pattern at every delay. So then um, you have a flower pattern at every time. So then for that flower pattern, you can know its orientation and its magnitude. So this fourth color map, the vertical cut will be a flower pattern and the horizontal cut will be what you see in the last page to see those little wiggles. So then the fit at every time delay is going to give us two independent parameters. One is the magnitude, one is the orientation. So you can still see this kind of oscillatory behaviors in both channels. But a interesting observation here is actually that the beating profiles oh, between the two channels are different. If the beating profiles are different, it's kind of saying that I at least have to have three modes here to provide two different beatings. And this is exciting to us for the reason that uh, in this particular compound, people only knew one frequency here when they did time-resolved reflectivity. But because we coupled into this so-called fair rotational nature, now we can actually see three modes in the originally thought one mode location. And we had further results in this particular study to say that we can track some transient uh, pump-induced phase transition more sensitively by relying on these three modes instead of one mode. Because one mode didn't show changes, while three modes can show changes as you increase your pump fluence. Okay. So that pretty much sort of wrap up the first part about this fair rotational nature. So we basically proved that we can see it, and then we can image it, and then we can also see the dynamics of it. So we, 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 let's end by saying why we see that, okay? So for this particular measurement, we are relying on the so-called electroquadrupole SHG. For the electroquadrupole SHG, we will have two copies of incoming electrical field, right? And then we will have one copy of the outgoing SHG field. But in addition to that, the electroquadrupole radiation depends on the gradient of the field. And the gradient of a plane wave is going to be the wave vector. So then we will also have another vector that is the wave vector. So then we in total have four vectors. So then you do the sort of combination of different uh, vectors to eventually construct this guy here, 
which is of the four, you will have four indices since we have four vectors. So then it is this one that actually have the very same symmetry as the Fourier rotational order parameter. And here A to G is just a notation of the symmetry of that uh, Fourier rotational order. So then imagine you only do linear optics. So in linear optics, you have one vector in, one vector out. Both of them are electrofield. So then using two of them, however you do the combination, you cannot construct something that is of the same symmetry. So that's why linear optics were not able to see the presence of this, this, this thing. Okay. Okay. So then we can move to the second part. The first part, the experimental signature is actually not so small, right? Because we clearly see the flower pattern rotated significantly by tens of degrees. So the second part is about the dipole. Okay. So let me say a little bit of the second part as an introduction. So the second part concerns a thing called wild semi-metals. So for wild semi-metals, there are two big families. So one family is those ones break spatial inversion symmetry. They can be either polar wild semi-metal or chiral wild semi-metal. And another family is a magnetic wild semi-metal that breaks time reversal symmetry. So wild semi-metal can only be present if either of spatial inversion or time reversal symmetry is broken. So if your system have both, then you cannot have wild semi-metal. So then for the first family, the recent theoretical development and also experimental progress actually showed a very interesting progress. That is, they can relate the second order nonlinear op optical response or optical electronic response to the Berry curvature of the wild semi-metal. Okay. And this is totally goes through the electrodipole transition procedure. Yeah. So so this is the literature here. Basically, in addition to be very sensitive to symmetries, now they care about the magnitude of the second order nonlinear responses. And then they can assign the magnitude to be related with a simple quantity of your wave function, which is a bare curvature related quantity. Okay. But if you do a contrast for the magnetic version, the magnetic ones, most of them keep spatial inversion symmetry. So then this will make the leading order electrodipole is gone. So then there has been like teeny tiny, very little experiments done on the magnetic wild semi-metals because of this conventional wisdom saying if you have inversion symmetry, SH is no longer there. But if you imagine for this one, your Berry curvature is still the same Berry curvature in the magnetic case as compared to the non-central symmetric case. If Berry curvature is a driving force behind it, so then nonlinear optics would have some kind of impact even in the magnetic wild semi-metals, right? Yeah. So that was sort of like our first motivation to look into this compound. But let me do a disclaimer at the beginning. <laughs> so our measurement is still focused on the symmetry. We haven't gone to the level that we can quantify the strength of the nonlinear optics so that we can relate to the wave function topology yet. Okay. So then from here below, we are actually still seeing, focusing on the symmetry evolution as a magnetic setup. But it is meaningful for the reason that the wild semi-metal physics cares about the magnetic states. If people didn't know the magnetic states well enough, perhaps the knowledge on the wild physics is also not so completely understood there. Okay. Okay. So our candidate compound is this cobalt tin sulfide. So again, this is a layered structure, ionically bonded between layers. And then the main part is this Kagomi lattice here by the blue dots. Okay. Again, it has the very same point group as we saw before for the previous talk. So inversion symmetric, three fold rotational symmetry, three mirrors. Okay. And indeed, in this compound, the magnetism is very puzzling. So this is vertical axis is a temperature. So then as people cool down, people know that there are two important temperature scales. One is just 175. The other is just 125. Okay. So above the 175, it's pyromagnets. Below 175, it's kind of interesting for this magnet. You now have to think its magnetic moment out of plane differently from the magnetic moment in plane. Usually when we think about conventional magnets, once this is just entire object. Once it's ordered in plane and auto plane, you order together. But this thing is a bit strange. Okay. So below 175, the auto plane moment orders ferromagnetically. 
But the implant moment, people have debates, either say antiferromagnetic or keep on fluctuating, unstable. And then below 125, the outer plane keeps to be ferromagnetism. The implant, one case says, no longer have any implant component. The whole thing goes to outer plane. That's one option. Or people say that, OK, this fluctuation got frozen, but frozen in a fairly disordered way. They call it spin ice. And then there are also other options says this fluctuation turns into antiferromagnets. So then there are just uh, unknown um, knowledge about this particular magnetism. So then we do our measurement in a similar fashion. We first check at uh, high temperature. So this is looking at high temperature in the four channels again. So um, let me just uh, say using the electroquadruple SHG, we can fit the data fairly well. And this is a con the smaller plot is the linear reflectivity measurement. I do the same measurement, but I choose the color to be the incident wavelength. So then you can see that you can only see a full circle, full circle, and nothing and nothing for the linear response. So then when we do a cool down experiment, park at one particular polarization channel, what we see here is this curve with circles is for the SHG. And the data with green and red squares are for the linear responses, either 400 or 800. So by this contrast, we can clearly see that in SHG, I capture two temp temperature scales. But in linear optics, I didn't see anything there. So this sort of tells us that SH can help us to capture um, more process than the linear, pro linear optics captures. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. so then um, in order to do any symmetry analysis or relate to what's happening in the material, we still have to do this flower pattern measurement. So we do the flower pattern measurement at high temperature and at low temperature. So the high temperature is this gray curve. The low temperature is this blue curve. You can immediately see that for all the channels, oblique or normal, the intensity all gets bigger in all the six channels. And then we also care about the orientation. So then the orientation is not so easy to see in the polar plot. So then we normalize the intensity of the high and the low temperature and put their curve into this Cartesian plot. So then you can see that the gray curve shifts a little bit relative to the blue curve. And this phase shift is to say that the flower pattern rotated a teeny tiny. And the rotating angle here is only a couple of degrees. So it's indeed very small. So then, so we see two things. One is the intensity grows bigger. The other is the orientation changes. So we want to know what each of them are trying to tell us. So what we can do is that we can scan this flower pattern across a line of the sample. So then when we do this, of the six spot, we can see we have six patterns, or six patterns has increased intensity as comparing to the high temperature phase. But when we look, look at their orientation, we can see that the orientation actually oscillates. Some location goes clockwise, some location goes counterclockwise. So this tells us a information that the intensity is actually measuring whatever order is. It's that order's square because we know it's a magnetic order. So magnetic orders square restores time reversal symmetry. So that's why I don't see a difference if even if I have two types of domains or even four types of domains, because I'm measuring the square of them through the intensity. But for the orientation, I'm actually measuring the order parameter itself. The order parameter can be either positive or negative. That's why the orientation can be either clockwise or counterclockwise, okay? So then we also do the same temperature dependent measurement, and then we extract the temperature dependence of intensity and temperature dependence of the orientation. And we know that for the intensity one, it's proportional to the so-called order parameter square. So what we are fitting here is to dissect the temperature dependence into three contributions. One is coming from the crystal structure because we had SHG at high temperature. And then the second one is the first kick up due to the auto plane spin moments ordering. And the second one is due to the second transition. Okay. What's interesting here is actually their 
critical exponents. For the first one, the critical exponent is about 0.32. That is consistent with the 3D Eisen type of magnets. So this is consistent with literature been saying that my outer plane moment forms ferromagnetism, so 3D Eisen. But then the second transition, the critical exponent is 0.35. This coincides with the so-called 3D XY type of magnet. XY is to say that my spin is sort of isotropic in the plane. So then, for this reason, we assign the second one to be this implant component forming this all-in, all-out texture. So this, pa uh, this page is to show the um, temperature-dependent orientation, which also have three contributions. At higher temperature, because the crystal structure has a mirror, so then my pattern is locked to the mirror. So nothing for the first contribution. The second contribution is due to the orientation change because of the ferromagnetism. The third contribution is because of the anti-ferromagnetism sets in. And uh, we said the orientation and the intensity are actually independent parameters. So then the fits of the critical exponents from these two channels are supposedly to be independent. So then you can do cross-check of them. So this cross-check ends up to be pretty well. From this one, we get the very same exponent as compared to the intensity channel. So then the conclusion for here is that uh, when we think about the magnetism in this particular compound, below 175, the outer plane orders ferromagnetically, the in plane keeps on fluctuating. And then below the 125, the outer plane keeps to be ferromagnetic, and the in plane forms a all-in, all-out anti-ferromagnetism. When you actually see the spin texture, it's actually conical, conical, yeah, it's non-coplanar, okay. So that is the magnetism. So then it opens a question of whether this kind of uh, spin texture matters for the wild physics. So it is a opener question for now. And then to the step say whether we can relate our signal to the wild physics. So for now, because the signal level is so low at this wavelength, um, and this wavelength is already the wavelength we have the best photon detectors. So in order for us to get into the wild physics, we need to use longer wavelengths. But the disadvantage for longer wavelengths is really we don't have good detectors there. So it's also a sort of like um, ongoing field whether we can find more sensitive detectors in longer wavelengths so that we can bring this kind of more sensitive techniques down to longer wavelengths where the topology plays a more important role. Okay, so this finish up my talk. I hope that uh, I convince you this technique is good. <laughs> and we demonstrate it in two systems. There are many other systems in principle they can work out. So with that, thank you so much for your time and attention. <laughs>